Now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, webinar for April 5th, 2018, Building Your Communities Tourism Strategy with the RV at Parks and Campgrounds. My name is Susan Lowe, and I am broadcasting from Victoria, which is in the unceded traditional territories of the people. Um, that's the Songhees and the Squamals. Thank you. I'm just going to look after some audio issues here. There we go. All right. There are two options for logging in. Uh, if you're trying to get your audio to work, if your computer's running a little bit slow, uh, you can use the phone number that's on the audio panel. Uh, if you click over to phone call, it'll give you a phone number, uh, an access code, which gets you into this webinar, and a PIN number, which identifies you uniquely as the person you registered as on the webinar. If you use someone else's link, there will be two of you on the webinar, and it gets confusing if we try to allow one of you to speak to uh, ask a question or something like that. Uh, there's, I'm just going to go over the control panel options for you in case you're new to the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, this is what you should be seeing, although it doesn't say BC Economic Atlas Webinar Test at the bottom. It has today's webinar title. Uh, the Orange arrow lets you hide or unhide your control panel. The blue button lets you go full screen if you want to see us really big. And the raise hand button lets me see you uh, want to ask a question. However, there are many of you and one of me, and today I have a tiny little screen. So uh, what I would suggest you do is if you want to get our attention or ask a question of one of the panelists, Type it into the enter a question for staff menu, and uh, I will be working on getting to those questions and asking them in the Q&A session uh, and, uh, as we go along. Um, today's session uh, is a little bit interactive. We have the ability to do polls, and that includes pop quizzes. So we have, uh, I'm just going to try and pull up a, uh, a poll here for uh, giving you an opportunity to show us who you are, and this gives you practice filling out one of the poll questions. So what type of organization do you represent? Oh, things are going a little slowly here because I only have one screen. So we're collecting up information about who you are and what kind of organization you come from. Not how many pets do you have. That'll have to be for another poll day. So I usually leave these open for about 30 seconds. Some of them will, in fact, be pop quizzes about the content that you just heard. So uh, don't forget to pay attention. Here we go. We are in 90% voted. We have fabulous voter turnout. Good for us. That's excellent. Uh, so we have, I'll close the poll now, and I will share the results with you. 50% of you are from local governments, 12% from First Nations or Indigenous organizations, 12% from tourism develop or marketing organizations, 8% from economic development agencies or Chamber of Commerce, and 19% of you chose provincial government or other. We only have five options in each poll, so I had to group those together. So that's how a poll works, and uh, we will be going to have a couple of those, so stay attentive as you're going through the webinar. So the objectives of today's webinar are, uh, here we go, I'll hide that and commence my screen sharing. Uh, today we want you to be able to articulate the value of RV parks and campsites to an overall tourism strategy for a community. And we have two examples and we want you to be able to relate useful lessons from those examples to your own community context. Uh, today's presenters, we have Don Ruckel from uh, Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. Next, we'll have Joss Penny from the BC Lodgings and Campgrounds Association. And then our two uh, community examples, we have Michael Bornowski from the District of Mission talking about the Stave West Recreation Area. And finally, we'll have Chris Bauer from Incomeep uh, RV Park, which is owned by a Soyuz Indian Band. Uh, we're hoping he's going to be able to join us. On the, on the webinar, we're just having some technical challenges today. So I'm going to oh, turn I'm, things over. Oh, Chris, you've managed to join us. 
Oh yeah, no, I've been on for a little bit. You just, oh, that's uh, fabulous. Yeah, yeah, so. Great. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn things over to Don now for an introduction and um, to get us started with some information about uh, campgrounds. Don, it is coming to you. She just has to do something on her screen here. So yeah, there we go. Uh oh, back. <laughs> okay, now do you have my full screen with we the webcam at the side? Okay, let me just fix that then. One moment, please. Oh, I don't think we have the webcam, so you're you're okay You're just right. showing your slides. Okay, and the webinar thing at the side is fine. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, so my name is Don Ruckel. I'm a senior policy analyst within the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, and I uh, work with the BC RV and Campground Association, um, BC, sorry, Joss, <laughs> BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association. Um, and what we work towards is uh, making sure that the RV and campground sector is competitive in British Columbia. So as you all probably know, tourism um, is big business in BC. It's a very important economic um, driver. And for communities, it's a very important economic and community development tool. Uh, so its growth is really fueled by having um, diverse, memorable, unique experiences and uh, providing you know, um, easy access, quality products, excellent service. And what we try to do in the province and to remain competitive is meet the visitors' evolving travel preferences. And part of that is RV and camp camping. So the tourism industry itself is, is a vast interwoven network of businesses, industry organizations, government agencies, and they're all working together to grow and sustain a dynamic industry. Um, and this, of course, in turn stimulates our economy and creates jobs for British Columbians. So as such, it's a very key sector of our economy. And um, as we can see by the numbers you see on the screen, the numbers are compelling. If you look at the top, the revenue generated um, $17 billion, which is a 7.9% increase, uh, 2015 to 2016 numbers. And this increases we're seeing year over year with anticipated growth of at least 5%, whereas the general economy is sitting around three and a half. So, um, the industry itself doing really, really well despite sluggish economy. <clears throat> you can also see that it is important to the business community and to um, communities themselves. So if you see by this, this is a poll that you're probably, the ECDEV people are gonna be very familiar with. This is a recent BC Chamber of Commerce survey. And it showed that nearly 90% of respondents say that BC's visitor economy is going to become more and more important over the next decade. That's that top line that you're looking at. And over half of the respondents pegged it as top in importance. And that's followed by clean energy, technology, health services, international trade. So you can see that communities are recognizing that this is a very important economic development tool. Um, you're also probably familiar with the 2016 local economic development in BC survey. And tourism and cultural activities were ranked top as priority for economic development efforts only after business retention and expansion, which is always at the top. So you can see these are uh, tourism, their products, the infrastructure that goes along with it are top of mind for community and economic developers. So most communities have already adopted and incorporated tourism development into their community plans. Today, what we want to specifically talk about is why the RV and camping sector is important to consider in that plan as well. So what we're seeing over, um, over at least the last decade is a significant rise in, in growth of this particular sector. Now, as an indication, um, ICBC shows us that over the last 10 years, there's been a 32% increase in the number of insured RVs. And how they do that is they just take a snapshot in the middle of July, which is a, is a good way to look at it. However, 
what's happening in the province is that the number of campsites in BC has remained relatively static. There's not enough sites to meet the growing demand, especially in high season, especially in high demand areas. So what's the province doing to try to help support this sector? Because of course, we want to meet this demand in order to be a competitive destination to all visitors in all markets. Um, <clears throat> so what are we doing to help meet, to help address this demand? Well, we work very closely, as we said, with the BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association, which represents this sector in our province, to try to see what we can do to help um, mitigate any barriers, et cetera. Um, over the past couple of years, the province uh, in, um, in partnership with Destination British Columbia has been engaging in a destination development process. And many of you have, will be familiar with this. Uh, what we're doing is looking at what tourism needs in terms of infrastructure, product, um, um, destination development tools in order to be uh, um, creating quality visitor experiences, uh, delivering a ha high standard of service and having the amenities in place to generate and sustain a competitive industry. So <clears throat> we're working with communities and stakeholders across the province to develop this and RV and camping has definitely been considered within this process. <clears throat> the province at its end is investing um, almost $23 million in the next five years for camping expansion in BC parks and rec sites throughout the province. But even that does not begin to meet the demand that is out there. And also we support the industry by, by proclaiming RV and Camping Week in British Columbia. And this aligns with the Canadian RV and Camping Week, which is the week after the May long weekend. And that involves uh, different campgrounds and dealerships across Canada, um, offering specials, encouraging camping, and also in support of Make-A-Wish Foundation. So that's some of the few things that we're doing to support that sector. Um, and as I said, we work closely with the BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association, helping to address those barriers. And they're great about talking to us about how we can support them. And so at this point, I'll pass it over to Joss Penny, who's executive director of the association. He can talk more about the trends and the value um, of the industry and why you would want to include that in your own development. Hey, thank you, uh, Dawn. Is it over to me, uh, Susan, yet? Oh, um, actually, I thought we might just do a little pop quiz and see how much people have been paying attention. How does that sound? I'm going to launch a poll here. Here's your pop quiz. How much provincial tax revenue came from tourism in BC based on, uh, based on Dawn's presentation? We've got uh, lots of different numbers here. Now, Don, I'm actually going to make you uh, <laughs> check the answers here. This is tricky because uh, actually these were mostly numbers that came from your presentation. So. I think that was a tricky question. <laughs> these are on the slides. All right. It's been 30 sec 40 seconds now. I'll close it. Uh, now, Don, do you remember the answer? The answer is 1.1 billion. There we go. 5% right. increase over last year. Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of those other numbers came from other things like how much is contributed to GDP and things like that. And then 2.3 billion is, I just threw that number in because it sounded like a nice round number. All right, we will move on now and uh, we'll have uh, Joss Penny join us. Joss, I'm gonna send the presentation over to you. Here we go. Uh, is my screen showing? It is indeed. That is correct. <laughs> that is uh, reversed. Reversed. I knew it would be reversed. <laughs> Folks, is, we're having a kind of technology day today through and through. It seems all of us have been bitten. I'm not sure how I move it. Oh, you go up to the display settings and uh, back where you were, go to display settings and then it'll uh, let you reverse the display. Okay. No, nope, it hasn't let me do it. Oh, no, wait, don't stop there. Go to display settings, top left. 
don't see it. Over to the left, your your mouse is on the right. Oh yeah, display sending. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Very everybody. We're rolling. <laughs> Uh, keep bearing in mind. Yeah, as as was introduced, I'm Joss Penny. I'm the executive director of the uh, BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association. I'm really, really pleased to work with the uh, with the ministry on on trying to promote the RVing and camping sector. Um, uh, I'm also the chair of the uh, Camping and RVing BC Coalition, which is which I'll explain a bit about as I go into the into the next slides. So I'm going to run through some information on what, who are the sector players in campground and the RV sector, a little bit about the economic value of camping, some market demand for camping, a little bit about segmentation of who the campers are, some nights uh, that, that are spent camping throughout British Columbia, some of the equipment used, and then I'm going to talk a bit about some of the uh, trends that uh, we still see in, in camping. So you should now be on a slide that, that uh, lists some of the key sector uh, players. Um, there are 1,500 uh, market-ready campgrounds in British Columbia, representing over 50,000 sites. Uh, they fall into the uh, four main categories at the top of this slide, which is provincial parks. And there are about 340 uh, provincial parks with about 55% of their campsites being um, uh, uh, reservable. And they represent about 11,000 campgrounds, campsites, sorry. Privately operated campgrounds, which I include in that group, the municipal and First Nations, because there isn't uh, really a, a catch-all uh, for them. And we're talking about 500 campgrounds in that uh, uh, across British Columbia, we're representing about 30,000 sites. And then we've got national campgrounds, which are run by Parks Canada, of which we have 14 located in, in uh, British Columbia, some of them being marine. And then we have recreation sites and trails, which are operated by the provincial government, but uh, are partnered with various groups, some of which are First Nations and some are, uh, are charitable groups. Then the other part of the RV industry is made up of the RV rental fleet. Now, the RV rental fleet primarily rents 3,500 rentals uh, between Calgary and Vancouver for the international market. And that represents about 5% of the total nights that uh, are camped, or about 385,000 campsite nights. Then you've got the dealers, which everyone's probably familiar with, seeing all those dealers out and about there. They sell the equipment and they service the equipment. And then you've got uh, retail. These are the other companies that are heavily involved in, in camping. It could be Cabela's, sporting stores, Walmart, Canadian Tire, Mountain Qu Equipment Corp, those types of, of pit players. And then you've got some ancillary services, uh, which you're probably not so familiar with. Those are the players that are offering RV insurance. It's ICBC, oh, sorry, RV storage. It's ICBC with insurance. It's, it's municipalities, garages, and other places with sanity dumps. And then you've got the final uh, sector, which is manufacturing, most of which isn't manufactured in BC, but it's people like Coleman, Northern Light, uh, Winnebago, Airstream, et cetera. I'm going to go a little bit in the economic value, similar to what Dawn did, but what you can see in the top uh, table here now is the summary for, for Canada, the total impact of the camping industry. It's broken down uh, from a, a survey that was done in 2015 by the Canadian Camping and RVing Council, and they looked at four areas, RV and camping retail activities, RV manufacturing, travel expenditures, which is really the uh, uh, recreation campsite rentals, food and beverage, and, and the in-community expenditures and other expenses, which are insurance, maintenance, storage of RV units. Overall, in 2014, the uh, the camping industry uh, uh, had a total tax reach of more than $1 billion, which was previously reported. Uh, it employed about 60,000 people Canada-wide, uh, of which 7,200 of those are located in British Columbia. And the GDP in BC for that year was around $606 million. So BC camping and RVing market demand primarily comes from three short haul markets. What you're seeing here is the results of a study that we did uh, with Destination British Columbia and Align Consulting and Google, where we're benchmarking some of the people that come to Google and we interviewed uh, uh, an end figure of 500 for BC, 500 for Alberta and 500 for Washington. And then we extrapolated how, how that would have looked. So what you can see of the short tools uh, uh, market study, there are about 2 million campers that are likely to camp in British Columbia in the next two years. So there's significant demand uh, from that. BC obviously being the biggest of the group, 43%, 
followed by Alberta, 31%, Washington State, 26%. Bear in mind, this is just our short tool markets, and I'd already mentioned in a slide before that we had 385,000 uh, uh, nights from international travelers, and we have rest of Canada and rest of, uh, of USA, which would probably make up another five to six percent of, of the market camping. So, what's this group sort of segmented down? Uh, uh, we did uh, a study to find out how many households there are, and and sort of what is the uh, um, the, the demographic and psychographic characteristics of the people that are coming camping. And what you can see here is broken down into four empty nest explorers, uh, which are equated to approximately 319,000 households in British Columbia, affluent adventures, 276,000 households in British Columbia, millennial couples, about 144,000 households, and then the rustic campers, 101,000. Obviously, they're not all camping, uh, uh, but they are potentials for camping. And to get they make up about 44.5% of the total households in British Columbia, or 1.8 million. So the market size is pretty significant uh, for those that are likely to camp or RV. We also asked in the same uh, study, uh, what sort of nights are spent camping? So we had a distribution of, of how they're sort of camping. And you can see it's pretty even. Uh, some people want to three nights only going up to 31 uh, nights at, uh, at 18 percent uh, of the sample. Other studies are consistently shown that campers take an average of four camping trips a year. So that's why you're getting these larger numbers of 8 to 14 and 15 to 30. These are those people that are likely taking more than uh, uh, four to five trips in a, in a year. Taking the 1,500 campgrounds that I mentioned earlier with the 50,000 campsites that are available overnight, that's about 4.4 uh, a million nights that are, that are housed uh, between the main camping season of May to uh, October. These people are citing that their top reasons for getting away are to enjoy nature. Uh, the tenters have more emphasis on nature than RVers. They're more interested in the social aspect of the camping and RVing. And the most popular activities are hiking or walking. They choose campgrounds based on the appearance, environmental cleanliness, and the price. And they're all Oh, and I repeat, all seeking Wi-Fi, even though they're looking to get away from nature. Equipment used for camping and RVing. I threw this slide in quickly so you could see the distribution. Overall, the most popular camping equipment is still the tent or, or tent trailer. And then about half of the campers uh, uh, um, use uh, RVs uh, or go cabin camping. Some of the trends, what are the trends and why are we looking at developing campgrounds or sustaining the existing campgrounds that are there? It's been widely reported in the press in 2016 and 17 that there have been shortage of overnight campgrounds and campsites in the peak seasons of July and August. Many British Columbians cannot book sites uh, uh, on B at BC parks or private sector campgrounds during those peak times. Uh, some of this is going to be addressed with the government's uh, announcement of expanding uh, uh, the number of uh, rec sites and the number of, uh, uh, of sites in BC parks. But I mean, the, the, the rest of these trends will speak to what's really happening and driving more demand. Redevelopment potential. Private campgrounds and RV parks are being targeted for redevelopment because uh, for uses that satisfy investment opportunity. There's two reasons mainly for this. One, a lot of the ones are seeing urban uh, encroachment, and so therefore the land is more valuable to be uh, redeveloped as affordable housing or other types of housing. And the second one is that uh, the aging infrastructure of the campgrounds is making them less desirable to uh, sell as going concerns, and so they're being redeveloped uh, in, instead. Business diversification in, in the private sector and the RV park operators are actually diversifying their business to make their campgrounds more sustainable income-wise year-round. We're seeing more winter rentals, we're seeing yurts, uh, we're seeing year-round seasonal rentals, we're seeing uh, a move towards glamping, uh, putting in high-end tents, uh, trailers and authentics for people to rent because they have a higher yield. A trend that wasn't uh, uh, known uh, 10 years ago is the increase of, of the lifestyle interest from millennial campers. Millennial campers are looking at, uh, uh, at RVing uh, in particular as a lifestyle choice. 
Some of them are choosing to live in their RV year round. And the prime reason for them being able to camp more is that technology allows them to be able to get out of their, uh, their own usual environment. We're in the tsunami of baby boomers retiring and taking up RVing in large numbers. And uh, that's going to continue for a number of years. Technology is also uh, enabling more demand. There are some services that are, that are sort of opening up uh, uh, RV rentals. RV Easy and Outdoorsy are the two that I've put there on the, uh, on the screen. Those are renting privately owned RVs that were previously stored for a large number of days during the camping season, putting more people on the road and creating campsite demand. That kind of concludes my uh, presentation, so I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to you, Susan. Thanks very much, Joss. I'm just going to take control back here and uh, get going again. We have, uh, as always, we have uh, a, a pop quiz question, and then I've got a couple of questions from our audience uh, to ask uh, you, Joss, before we carry on. So the first one, here's your pop quiz. Uh, we looked at the... the um, Segments of the population, I believe this was in Joss's presentation, that's how I got it. Uh, so what, which of the following are not one of the uh, demographic profiles that you might find in your campground? And this one should be fairly straightforward and easy, although um, I think everyone desires to be a gorgeous clamper, perhaps. But uh, I had to throw this one in just... Uh, just for a bit of pop quiz fun, because things should be fun. So the uh, I'm going to close the poll now. The correct answer is you gorgeous glampers, although they exist, are not one of the demographic profiles that was defined in the research uh, on the demographics of campers in BC. I've got a couple of other questions uh, to ask before we go on. Joss, I'm curious to know if stats by season are available, so to compare winter and off-season versus summer high-season camping. Um, the short answer is no. I mean, we only began our winter camping campaign last year, so we only have one year's worth of, uh, of knowledge as to uh, how that's going, and we, we had about 150-odd campgrounds, both BC parks and, and private sector campgrounds that were participating. The Camping and RV and Coalition has a research budget and I certainly can make sure that that question is asked in that uh, in, in next year's uh, survey. Great. Okay. And um, any good BC examples of farm experiences for camping? Oh, oh you mean like uh, agritourism? I, I think I think what the question was talking about was um, when people are invited to, to stay on farms and uh, yeah, experience the, uh, the farm environment, so maybe helping out with uh, farm tasks and things like that. Well, there are a number of people that are in agritourism, but I mean, uh, with regards to the, the farm experiences, is that, I mean, they're usually with the agritourism, as most developers know, it's 10 sites or less. So uh, uh, may, primarily they're not, they're not in, some of them aren't in the overnight business. So I don't actually have any examples of that. I mean, I, I know some people that have working orchards uh, uh, that, that do allow people to camp in them, but they don't, they don't actually have them working on the farm. So uh, I'm not really sure if it, that's really a trend that's, that's big or something that's happening. So. Okay, well maybe looking into the agritourism part of things um, is another way of finding resources for that. Um, someone else, Wiley asked if we'll, we're going to have access to your presentation notes because there was a lot of stats in there. Um, so people know we'll be posting those presentations with the re recording of this webinar. Um, it takes me about a week to put things together and get them up on our economic development portal. Um, we also have the um, now I'm, I'm going to take a, a hope here that the handouts section of this webinar platform is working today. We have two handouts that should be available on your control panel um, if you click on it. Uh, we've loaded in the 2015 Economic Impact of Camping Report from uh, for, that's a, a nation, nationwide report and also uh, an RV park development checklist that I, we might get used or be useful to you in developing it. Oh, we have one more question here. Um, is it possible to get stats on the tourist traffic through the Hyder border crossing? 
And how do you get that information? Um, and I'm going to just Maybe see. One door. Yeah, I'm just going to unmute. Hi, yeah. Yeah, um, Destination British Columbia, I believe, uh, collects stats on uh, border crossings and, um, and you know what, I'm not sure if they're the, the actual source, but they do monitor stats on border crossings. I don't know about if they're broken down per, per border crossing, um, but uh, you, whoever the question was from, um, please email me and I can see if I can follow up on some numbers for you. Okay, and the, the just to, uh, to make it easier, the email address is uh, just your name, Dawn, D-A-W-N dot Ruckel, your last name, R-U-E-C-K-L, at gov.dc.ca. Just Correct, that. awesome, thanks. Okay, great. Um, all right, we're going to move on now, and we have Michael Bornowski from the District of Mission, who's going to be talking about the State West Recreation Area. I'm going to just hand things over to Michael here. Thank you, and uh, I am just trying to make sure that I'm showing the right thing. Um, there we go. How does that look for everybody? Are you seeing my uh, presentation now? We are, thank you. Yay! Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Be before I begin, um, I need to acknowledge that Mission is on the unceded ancestral lands of the Stolo people. That includes the Kwantlen, Lakamal, Matsqui, and Scowlitz nations. Uh, and um, we, we work uh, very closely um, with the Kwantlen Nation, especially um, on the Stave West Forest and Recreation Area project, uh, increasingly on, on forestry and, and cultural activities uh, throughout the district, um, given that this is uh, located you know, in, in what they will consider the heart of their traditional territory. So that's just important for me to mention before we begin. Um, I am here to talk about the Stave West Forest and Recreation Area. Uh, I'm happy to take any and all questions at the end. This is going to be a little less data heavy um, and a little more um, sort of feely and, and um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, based on, on, on values in a little early stage. Um, so, so bear with me through that. I appreciate your patience here. Um, what I'd like to talk about uh, is, essentially the importance of building partnerships and trying to do something in a bit of a different way um, in developing outdoor recreation, tourism, education, uh, and then protecting, preserving cultural use and, and heritage sites uh, as a way forward, both for economic development, but also for social development across our communities. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Stave West story, our goals and strategies, and then get to where we stand today. Um, where is Stave West? You, you may not know where Mission is. We are a, um, what many consider small, but about 40,000 people on the north shore of the Fraser River, about 60 kilometers from Vancouver. Stave West is located um, on the western shoreline of the Stave Reservoir, um, and uh, it is half of our tree farm, uh, about 50 square kilometers. Mission is one of the two municipalities that operates our own forestry enterprise and has a tree farm license. We've done that since uh, 1958, so we are having a 60th anniversary this year. Um, and that has been a significant economic driver uh, for our community for many years. Um, and it's allowed us to do things like work um, as a forestry enterprise, work within our tree farm uh, to develop hiking trails like you see here on the screen. Um, all across Mission. We're really lucky to work in partnership with uh, the Fraser Valley Mountain Bike Association and uh, our Parks and Recreation Department. And we have fabulous networks of trails. Um, when, whenever we do uh, citizen satisfaction surveys, business recruitment retention strategy surveys, you know, one of the major drivers that bring people to this city is uh, the community feel but number one or two always on that list, and it bumps up and down, is the proximity and the availability uh, of outdoor natural experiences. It's why people move here to live and why people are increasingly bringing businesses here. Um, you know, professionals now live out in the valley because they can afford to, and they still get all of those amenities. The Stave West area um, can look exactly like this picture, which is from Stave West. It also can look like this. Um, it's been known as the Wild West. We had an issue. I moved to the Fraser Valley four years ago. When I moved here, my first trip 
uh, looked a lot like these magazine pictures. My first trip up the Florence Lake Forest Service Road into Staple West looked a lot like this. Uh, we have what I would call, you know, very gently reckless and or had reckless and dangerous shooting. Um, here are another couple examples, and you can see it, it was pretty significant. Um, is still in some parts pretty significant. However, we've been very lucky to work with uh, the regional district and the province uh, to manage target shooting and, and have created uh, regional buffers that uh, ban target shooting from 400 meters of any Forest Service road. And within Mission, we also brought in bylaws that, that regulate and, and limit where you can shoot what, where hunting can occur in season. Um, and so we've seen a real shift in terms of the activity in Stave West, but all of this misuse really created the germ of an idea, and that was how do we transform what is a sustainably managed forestry operation into that plus a destination for family-friendly outdoor recreation? How do we then combine that with uh, tourism and bring people for outdoor recreation from outside of Mission? And then building on that, how do we start to layer in education and place-based learning? Um, and so, you know, over the past, I would say, 10 years, we have progressively done layers of research and planning. And that, that started with recreational opportunities, a feasibility analysis, um, a, a, a feasibility study on uh, the potential for a Tim Horton Children's Foundation camp. They still have a license of occupation at one of the lakes in this day west area. And then through a master plan. And that master plan included significant public engagement and a planning team with representatives from uh, the District of Mission Council, uh, the Kwantlen First Nation, including council and the director of their business group, the provincial government, and then user groups, including Four Wheel Drive Association, uh, Community Futures, Economic Development, our Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Fraser Valley Mountain Bike Association and, and others as we talked about whether it was user groups or economic development, so many lenses. That master plan was adopted in 2015 and we're now into, uh, I guess we're entering our third year of implementation. Um, it's It's been very exciting. Over those years we've done a few things. We've continued to do planning. So we've done uh, designs for campgrounds, three of which should be opening this year. Um, we've continued to work uh, with the province and with the Kwantlen Nation around Sayers Lake Campground, which was open and, and has seen in improvements and enhancements. Uh, and then we've worked uh, on further studies on, uh, on what are the opportunities in terms of outdoor recreation, how do we layer in RV camping along with the more rustic, you know, tent camping that you see happening in, in some of the forest rec sites that the province will build and then have hosting contracts with. And on top of all of this recreation, we've really focused on developing educational partnerships and activities with students, specifically from BCIT. Um, and we've developed a bit of an outdoor learning alliance around Stave West. And the benefit here has been not only to our forest enterprise or to say sustainable resource management students who engage there, but those students have also helped us design campgrounds that are now being built, design trail networks where we're now doing the arc work to prove out these trail networks and starting to actually flag these. And so we're finding the opportunity for mission is to improve community health, to improve the health of our forests and, and develop recreation opportunities by engaging with educational institutes uh, around this State West project. And it's been it's been just phenomenally rewarding. So I'm going to move into a bit now, a bit more about where we are today. Um, this map now uh, before you shows locations for our eight new potential uh, campsites within the Stave West Forest and Recreation Area. It's also home to the Zajac Ranch for Children. We have uh, a license of occupation in the north corner around Pine Lake for the Tim Hortons Children's Foundation Camp. We've also more recently been approached by a uh, Cancer Camp for Kids Foundation who are looking to create a permanent home for uh, a kids' cancer camp in British Columbia. Um, and it's adjacent to Raleigh Lake. Now, there's an, we're lucky in terms of there being an abundance of, of lakes and uh, really interesting terrain. There's some additional challenges because we do have active forestry in the region at all times, so it is not a pristine backcountry environment, but it really is a uh, an enjoyable rustic front country environment where people can get in with easy vehicle access currently all the way up to um, the Zajac Ranch and, and our Kersley Creek campground that is opening this season. So the new campgrounds we've built this season 
include a, uh, a Rock Creek campground, which is at about seven and a half kilometer mark on the Florence Lake Forest Service Road, leaves Dudney and it is the busiest forest service road in, in British Columbia. Um, but this Rock Creek campground is a uh, motorized focus campground or focused for motorized users. So larger sites, some group sites, RV use is one of the primary uh, or RV campers or a primary target audience. And we've built into this campground with Ministry of Forests um, a staging area with loading and unloading area. And uh, it's designed around having families, individuals who are coming up with RVs uh, or with trailers and unloading. Um, you know, whether those are off-road trucks uh, or quads, dirt bikes, and then using those to access some of the old decommissioned logging roads in the area, working currently to try and find a, a, a way to move ahead with a four-wheel drive association to create a bit of a training loop so we can do safe driver training, uh, rescue and recovery training uh, with the four-wheel drive association at that campsite, bring some value add to it. Just past that is a Kersley Creek campsite right on the shore of the Fraser, or right on the shore of the Stave Lake uh, and adjacent to the Zajac Ranch for Children. And that's an equestrian themed campsite uh, with the additional design consideration of all along the shoreline. We've been, we've worked with the Ministry of Forests and Lands, uh, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development to design campsites with a little larger footprint and additional buffers so that as we look down the road to uh, bringing more glamping and more RV or, or semi-permanent structures in, there are uh, some, some you know, really unique campsites on the, uh, on the shoreline of the, of the Stave Reservoir. And then the Sayers Lake Campground and, and Rocky Point Campground. Sayers Lake is currently uh, uh, just completing a management agreement to get a host in there for this season. And Rocky Point, we're undertaking archaeology analysis um, and there are some really fascinating, fascinating uh, historical concerns as this really has been, um, you know, inhabited territory, an important territory for 10,000 plus years. Um, I had mentioned the Stave West Outdoor Learning Alliance only because I think in addition to our, our collaboration and, and, and relationship or, or partnership that we are developing with the Kwantlen Nation as a local government, developing partnerships and formalizing agreements with educational institutes and with school districts is, I think, crucial to moving a really complex project like this forward. Um, we've worked with the University of the Fraser Valley uh, and BCIT as our primary post-secondary Mission Public School District, and then the Zajac Ranch for Children as a facilities partner in just establishing that we do agree to work together as an outdoor learning alliance to advance place-based and, and outdoor learning specifically within the forest um, we're very excited. Just last year, Zajac Ranch were able to open an Aboriginal arts and culture building. Uh, we are having a stakeholders group meeting in there and, and we're looking forward to more and more educational programming happening in there uh, over the coming years. And our biggest concern in all of this is to reduce that dangerous and illegal activity that I talked about, this, the shooting. Um, we have had a lot of sort of drunk, rowdy behavior stemming primarily from the mud bogging activities out on the foreshore flats. Um, you know, we've worked with the RCMP to, uh, to, to increase our, our patrols. As a municipality, we've had to fund that to the tune of about eighty dollars to $100,000 per year in terms of overtime initiatives. Uh, as the dangerous and illegal activity has dropped, that expense directly to the city is dropping and we're currently working uh, in collaboration with the RCMP, Ministry of Forest, Conservation Officer Service, and others to, to develop a more coordinated approach. So that's not all happening on the, on the back of the, the local RCMP detachment. Um, and our biggest, one of our biggest challenges right now is, is reconciling the, the picture you see above me is the, the or a, a, the picture you see atop on this screen is the, the foreshore of, of uh, uh, Stave Lake. And you can see where, um, you know, it, it might be, it is an area that is flooded and then there's water drawn down because it's a, it's a, a man-made reservoir. You can see where really, really heavy uh, four-wheel drive use and off-road vehicle use has caused some pretty significant habitat or at least environmental degradation. Um, we have a really very active group who, who calls this Dirt Church. And then we have a really fantastic group, many of whom are part of Dirt Church or are part of the Four Wheel Drive Association who do phenomenal cleanups. So we have a really engaged community. Some of the activity is technically illegal. Some of it is 
horrific if you really care about archaeology and environmental concerns. But how, you know, our, our big work now is how do we continue to improve and advance our, our work with user groups, including off-roaders, to respect the natural and heritage values while respecting what is a very popular and, and, and economically uh, valuable activity. Um, just a, a probably a really big challenge that I think bears mentioning. Um, what you see here, we installed this last year um, with uh, Artisan Log Homes. Josh Litter from Artisan is in the middle there with his hand up. They are our first corporate sponsor, which is really interesting. So they donate time and labor um, and uh, built the structures for our new entry signs. What used to look a bit like a prison camp because it, uh, at one time was the entrance to a prison camp is starting to look very nice. But this picture really highlights the, the individuals and partnerships that we've built. And, and, you know, in here we see ministry staff, First Nations leadership, uh, foresters, educators, uh, and local government people, as well as stakeholders, um, you know, we're all working together on developing outdoor recreation and tourism, not just as an economic driver, but also to support the health of our community, the protection of heritage and natural resources, and then to provide opportunities for education and training. And I think that that holistic approach will really serve us well over the long term. Um, with that, I've sort of outlined where we're at and what we're doing with Stave West, and I'm open to to any questions. And I'll just I'll just hand this back or wait for it to be be handed back. I'll click stop showing screen, and uh, and hand back control. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Michael. That uh, that was really interesting. Um, it's fascinating to see how it has evolved and how many partners are required uh, to make that happen. Um, we do have, of course, a, uh, a comprehension pop quiz for you. Uh, if you've been paying attention, this one should be also fairly straightforward. I'm going to put the poll up now and let you vote on which of the following is a feature that was introduced in the Stave West Recreation Area in 2017. I'll let it stay open for about 30 seconds here. I have a sneaking suspicion based on the results that have been coming in so far that uh, we're going to have 100% correct answers on this. Oh, we're, we're, we're going to, we have some divergence. I'm going to, we've got only got 45% of you who voted. So those of you who have stepped away and are working on checking your emails or, uh, or writing an email, you're eating your lunch, this is a good time to come back and, and vote in the pop quiz. Susan, that's yes. Dawn. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I love the presentation and the way Stave Lake has things coming together. Um, and I just wanted to make a point that this is, um, in a sense, what Stave Lake is doing is a really a microcosm of the provincial destination development process. You have an uh, incredibly collaborative process looking for the uh, long-term planning and future of the destination. Um, there's some key elements there. Uh, not only is the uh, economic um, a valuable economic driver recognized, but it's all about um, environmental sustainability and preservation. It's about community and social development. It's about a long-term vision and how the visitor uh, can contribute to the long-term vision of the destination. That's really what the um, provincial destination development process is all about as well. So thanks so much for, for drawing those parallels there. Thank you very much. Uh, I, w I would say thank you for that. It, it, it's, it, it wasn't intentional at the beginning, but then members of the Stave West leadership team have been involved in those regional and provincial destination development initiatives throughout the years. We continue to be. And, um, and yeah, I, you know, what we're working on is trying to make sure that everything we do is, is a demonstration project. And it's been really rewarding to be recognized by Aboriginal Tourism BC as a provincial demonstration project of what really is possible. Uh, and I have to raise my hands in thanks to the Kwantlen Nation, especially for being willing to continually return to the table and work collaboratively and openly um, towards these initiatives. There, there certainly are roadblocks, especially when you're working with many levels of government. Policy is not, you know, uh, great at facilitating advancement. It's great at, 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 at you know, really measuring progress. And, and we've made very significant progress. I think because of that open collaboration with 
uh, the nation, with other nations, and, and with user groups, uh, as well as with the provincial government. Cool. Uh, Michael, I've got one question for you from one of our audience members. Uh, how much of an economic benefit does the mud bogging provide? There are, and you know, I have a, uh, I have a one-pager prepared by the Four-Wheel Drive Association that I should have brought up, um, that I should have brought up. So directly to mission, it, it is not a phenomenal economic driver, specifically in Stave West. The reason I make that, uh, the, the reason I state that is we know through uh, vehicle surveys that we've done, uh, although I haven't done one in the last two years, we know from visitor surveys that we've done that about 70% of the visitors come from outside of the District of Mission. And your primary, if you're coming from outside of the district, and, and typically from Metro Vancouver, so primarily, um, you know, those people are, are uh, or our visitors aren't coming into downtown Mission before heading back west and north into Stave West. And so, you know, we're at a point where we're really building foundations that we can then scaffold services and scaffold economic development on top of where currently we had, you know, where, where previously we had unregulated and unmanaged camping uh, in the forest. We had conditions that weren't safe for the foresters working in the forest. Now we have campgrounds. We can start to do user, user and visitor management, and we can start to, to scaffold economic development, uh, including providing services and goods to visitors like the four-wheel drivers, off-roaders. You know, they're expensive, and so there is an economic, there is, there is economic uh, activity related to, to four-wheel drive use, we haven't quantified what it is within the district of mission, knowing that the most significant contingent of those visitors are coming from outside the district and then leaving the district and not doing extended stays. So it's one of those opportunities that we need to, to delve into more, figuring out how do we, uh, what's the potential for extending the, the length of stay and uh, what's the value there if we can start to deliver goods and services built around that extended stay. Okay, and I have one more quick question that I want a quick answer to because then we've got to make time for Chris before everyone has to go back. Uh, can you estimate the District of Mission investment in State West? Yeah, uh, certainly I can. Uh, I would estimate, we've been in the implementation phase for three years, I would estimate the cost of implementation to us, in the, it would be in the total of around $300,000 over four years. Now that includes engineering designs, consultant work, um, survey expenses, uh, costs of hiring summer students, working collaboratively to get us to where we are, plus some investment in uh, actual road building to improve entryways to uh, or entry points. There's also been a few million dollars invested from the province and from other sources. Um, you know, whether that's through uh, Flinro, Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, or Ministry of Transportation for road upgrades because this was a forestry road and it's now been upgraded to I think about the 10 kilometer mark to a pretty good pretty good standard where you know if you have a Honda Civic and a tent in the back you can get up to the the first three campgrounds Ajax Ranch without any problem. Okay, that's perfect. That covers me. <laughs> All right, thanks, Michael. Um, we're going to move on now to Chris Bauer from the Soyuz Indian Band and uh, in Army Park. So I'm just gonna. Put the screen controls okay. over to Chris. It is coming your way. Oh. Show my screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see your whole presentation. There we go. We've got it going. Great. Take Everybody was looking ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm Chris Bauer. I'm the business development officer for the Osoyas and Band. And uh, I've been working for the Osoyas and Band actually since uh, 96. And then back in 1997, I was uh, given the task to help build up Inkeny Campground and RV Park. So I was hoping I, I was going to be able to give you uh, kind of a snapshot on what's happening here and what the, Im uh, the economic impact is like for the local communities that are close by. Now, to give you an idea, the Soy Indian Band, the Inkeny Campground and RV Park is, loaded at, is located at Inkeny Resort. We have 226 villas and suites. We have a winery. We have a cultural center. We have a nine hole golf course. And we have uh, 380 campsites. Oh, 
Okay. So to give you an idea, the layout of the campground we have is, sits on 40 acres. Out of the, the 380 sites, we have 155 sites that are open for the winter. And what we do is we actually charge, even though the band owns this business, we do an annual lease paid to the OIB administration. And throughout the years, we've been able now to build it up to $7.2 million in infrastructure. And we're running an annual revenue of $3 million. Now that's, and then uh, after that, we're doing uh, $1 million in annual profits. And that's, uh, of course, after amortization and also our lease payment. Now, let's see, to give you an idea on that community uh, impact, with us being open year round, that gives us uh, uh, the 12 months of business. And during the summertime, that's the peak time when the dollars are coming in. And we can do up to about 1,500 people per night during the summer season. In the spring and fall, it's actually when we start to get a lot of our international travelers and also a lot of the empty nesters, those explorers are, are coming during that season. So that kind of fills off in the, the spring and fall. Then the spring, during the winter time, we have a very large snowbird market, and we're running at about 200. Well, it's about 250 people per night that are within the campground. We've been running up to 100% occupancy during the winter time. Now, with being up to uh, you know 100 150 uh, you know 150 people per night in the summer season, um, we have. 15 year-round employees, but then we have another 15 full-time seasonal employed. So our annual payroll is running at 730,000. Now, with all this, we've calculated what the, the, the economic impact to the local community is at 19.2 million annually. Now, that could be a little bit of a lower estimate. I have to have a, our economist to come and take a look at our numbers. and. I'm expecting is actually over 20 million, but I didn't want to show that on the screen. Now, what's happening is we're getting, we're trending with the RVers. When I first started in 97, there was a lot of people that were, were tenting. They would have small units. They would start you know, building up from there. But within the last 20 years, now the units are getting larger. The vehicles that they're, they're pulling, you know, there's people with, Sixty to eighty thousand dollar trucks pulling eighty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollar trailers. Then we have motorhomes that are reaching up to the cost of one point five million, one point eight million dollars. So we have a, a a different clientele that's been been coming to our uh, RV park. So we're seeing a big impact with the hardware stores, supply stores that support the RV park, restaurants and food outlets. The, the grocery stores, because we're focusing on, you know, getting people to stay past the, the, the two to four day stays. We're really focused to help drive them staying a week to two weeks uh, during the winter quarter time. Of course, they're staying throughout the whole winter, but our real main focus is to do that. And our average stay is about four nights. The, the wineries, golf courses, cultural center, boat rentals and attractions, they're feeding off our, our 1,500 campers that have during the summertime. Uh, notice that there's a, there's a big spend that's happening on that end. And we also have a, a gas station. And when we built the gas station, it's a Petro-Canada that we had built. We put diesel at every tank. We, we laid out the, the, the parking lot so we'd be able to handle the large units to be able to come in. And we've been very successful in that. It's, actually increase the amount of fuel sales within the town of Osoyas. And one of that reasons is because they have those large tanks that they do a, a, a major focus on, on building. Now, that, that just kind of gave you a, a quick overview, and I was hoping that I could open it up for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are happy to have questions from people, and I've got Something. Uh, oh, we just had someone had to 
run and saying thank you very much to all the presenters yeah. and facilitators. Um, that, thank you very much, Krista. Uh, but she has left. Um, so um, does anyone else have any, uh, any questions? We have quite a few people still here on the presentation. So um, feel free to write in a question. Or at this point, I can actually see your hands because I'm looking there. So if you want to raise your hand, and then I can unmute your line, and you can ask a question and not have to type it in. I don't actually have a pop quiz for Chris's presentation. Alas, I ran out of steam on my pop quiz creation, but uh, I actually have some polls. Um, I'm going to ask one of my poll questions here uh, for people who are on the line. Does your community have a tourism development strategy? And if so, does it include RV and camping? So I'm opening that up right now. Um, Susan, it's Don again while they're... Yeah. Um while they're polling. Um, Chris, really appreciate that. And one of the things I truly appreciated was um, the numbers regarding local economic impact. That's some of the stuff that's really difficult in RV and camping is getting some good stats on, on those impacts. But what we're finding is that some of the assumptions that have been made about uh, campers and RVers just, just aren't the reality anymore. As you said, the daily spend is going up. They don't just you know, sit on the beach and eat hot dogs. It's way different. They like to bring their home with them when they travel their RV, but they're out there experiencing, doing, spending, and, uh, you know, taking advantage of the, the tourism offerings in the community. So I'm really glad that you are um, you guys are doing some work in that area and uh, increasing that awareness about uh, that particular market. Yeah, and we're even noticing with the snowbird market, we're even noticing an increased spend there as well. The snowbirds that are coming, they're, you know, when we first started out, a lot of those snowbirds, it was trying to find the cheapest way to stay within the area. Now it's going to, it's more of a, a lifestyle. It's a, an experience why they'll come for the RV. And, you know, they spend time in the clubhouse. They, uh, they're out in the community spending or at least two to three times during the week out eating in restaurants. Um, they go out in groups of 30 to 40 people and make reservations throughout the town. So that's a lot of the feedback we've been getting back from the community. So I've got a couple of questions in here uh, from Roxanne. Oh, not sure if her community's tourism development plan has uh, RV and camping in it, but she's going to check, and that is exactly what we want you to be doing after this webinar. Um, here's a question mm -hmm. related to the upcoming. I think this is probably for uh, probably a good question for Dawn to answer. Related to the upcoming announcement of 22.9 million into provincial campgrounds, how much of that will be allocated to Northern BC, and are there any upcoming grant opportunities for Northern campgrounds? The um, BC Parks and uh, the, the money that's being spent on campsite development uh, is partly BC Parks, which is the Ministry of Environment, and it's partly Rec Sites and Trails, which is under the Ministry of Forests, Lands and Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. So that um, that figure of 23 million in the next five years is all of that piece. Um, if you look at the Parks Canada website, they have um, they have done that. You can see the plan, and I believe, um, I may be a bit challenged on this, but I believe it also includes what is going to be invested in rec sites and trails, but they do have that development plan on the BC Parks website. You can find it there. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a question for Chris. Do you encounter any major operational challenges in the summer or any other season, uh, hiring staff, for instance, or other things? Um, <laughs> that's actually a, a, a big issue. So what we're working on we're, we're very fortunate is a lot of our band members like to work at the RV park. So, and something that we've done to help with that challenge is because we've actually have quite a few jobs is that we're hiring students. So during the summertime, it's a perfect opportunity to hire, you know, kids that are, you know, 14 years old and older and people coming back from university. So we've been able to fill a lot of those positions during that seasonal time. During the winter, spring, and fall, we're not having a problem filling it for the employees. So that's where we've done our focus. 
what we're doing also is we're bringing in staff housing that we're working on with the town of Osoyas and also the, the surrounding resorts. So that, that kind of the fill in. So we're, we're working on that issue because that is something that's happening, especially in the Okanagan Valley. Great. Thank you for the answer. So we have uh, we we have the results back. Forty percent of our respondents are working on building their tourism development plan right now, and twenty seven percent we don't have a tourism development plan that I'm aware of. Uh, and I know there's a number of people who aren't uh, working in communities right now, so the question doesn't really apply to me, or they don't know. Um, I have one more question. And, uh, and then we're going to move on to the closing part of the webinar. Is there any talk about adjusting the campground or RV reservation process to give priority for the first 30 days after reservations are available to BC residents and then the next 30 days to Canadian residents? Um, Don, I, I don't know if that's a, a tourism question or um, another ministry question, but can you take a stab at it or possibly direct us to who could answer the question? Uh, I am not intimately fi uh, familiar with the reservation system, but I believe that is managed through um, BC Parks and the Ministry of Environment. I know that they had revamped that reservation system and that new um, new parameters and new regulations were, um, over, were, were being introduced this year. So uh, I cannot answer that question, but um, I think that that would be one for the uh, Ministry of Environment and BC Parks. Okay, thanks very much. All right, so we have reached almost the end of our presentation time here. So I want to say a big thank you uh, to our presenters, uh, Don, Joss, Michael, and Chris. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting webinar to uh, to listen to. Um, next webinar coming up, it's only a week from today, it's called The More We Get Together, Innovation Spaces. And we're going to be talking about co-working spaces, um, fabrication spaces, innovation centers, uh, and the idea that if we put people in proximity to each other, working together, that innovation happens and it's, it is actually physical proximity that makes the difference. Um, here, and I'm just going to work with some sound here. Um, so that is coming up. There's a, a link there on your screen to register for that. And we'll ha we're hearing about uh, innovation spaces that are in Kamloops and Kelowna, but I know there's a lot of uh, other spaces being created. So if you know of an innovation space and you want to share an example or some wisdom, uh, then join in on this webinar. So some of you hopefully are, are now getting our invitations via the uh, the, our online webinar service. If you're not, if you heard about this from somebody else, here's a little link here. You can go online and sign yourself up for our invitation list. Um, and we have uh, one more thing, our Tech Dev 101 workshops. They are introducing tech and innovation basics, and uh, we've delivered four of them so far through the province. Um, they're generating very interesting dialogue. We had them in Castlegar, Cranbrook, Port Alberni and Campbell River, and there's more coming up uh, in the spring. And uh, happy to book these in your community for the fall. Uh, our, our facilitators come to you. We just ask you to help us uh, get a venue and lunch and help us uh, invite the right people. So right after this webinar, you'll get a link to a feedback survey. It'll also get emailed to you in about an hour after the webinar because I really want your responses. Um, the recording and as well the presentation slides will be posted to our economic development portal site in about a week and uh, you can go there and download these as well as the handouts that are here and uh, don't and also find out how to register for our next webinar. That takes it to the end of our session. Um, thank you very much to everyone for joining us, to the 26 attendees that stayed right until the end. Uh, go and get yourself a cookie, and I will see you again next week for Innovation Spaces. Uh, I'm going to close the webinar now, and it, it just turns everything off. It can be somewhat alarming, so get ready. Here we go. Thanks very much for attending. <laughs>